welcome to the Australian Prescriber Podcast. Australian Prescriber, independent, peer review, and free. We've learnt a lot about COVID-19 in a very short period of time. And one thing that's clear is that it's not just another flu. And in particular, managing COVID-19 has brought up some unusual challenges, which are far from routine in an infection. One of these challenges, which is rightfully evoked an element of fear, is a hyperinflammatory state known by many names, including cytokine release syndrome, an often deadly state which can emerge even in young people, just as the embers are dying on the infection and the viral load is dropping. To combat inflammation, we often evoke immunosuppression. But how does this sit in the context of an infective threat, and how do we find solutions rapidly, effectively, safely, and logically? I'm David Liu, and today we've been joined by Senthrin Shivakuma, who is the clinical pharmacology registrar at the Austin Hospital in Melbourne, where I also work. And he's the first author on an editorial which addresses some of these issues about immunosuppression and COVID-19 and what repurposing means in this era. Sen, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, David. So, Sen, tell me a little bit about what repurposing means in a pandemic? Because I think for a lot of people, even if this is something which has been quite familiar to them, a concept which they've thought about, the idea of repurposing might be one that they're not necessarily familiar with. Certainly, yes. It It is uh, something that's be- become a bit more in the forefront of what we're doing in terms of research and endeavours and clinical encounters as we are faced with this COVID-19. As we all know, it's taken over the world and has put a lot of demand on our healthcare system. And what we don't have a lot of time to work out is what effective therapies are available to us to treat this pandemic. And therefore, we fall back on medications that we've used in the past. And the reason we do that is could be explained by the fact that the process of developing a new drug takes a lot of time, time which is precious in a, in a pandemic. A normal clinical trial could take 12 to 16 years to develop an me- effective medication. The benefits, as I mentioned, from are not only from a time perspective, but also from others' perspectives of we do have some knowledge uh, about how these medicines work and um, we in terms of mechanisms of action from previous studies. We also have some awareness about how these medications work in the body and and safety profile is another thing we are aware of. And this knowledge can be very important in in a, in a situation where we have clinical uncertainty. This being said, there are some concerns. While these medications may have been effective in one indication, there is no necessarily guarantee that they may work in, in a COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore, they remain uh, experimental. There have been examples where medications have been repurposed for different indications. For example, more recently, sildenafil was used for treatment of erectile dysfunction and now is part of standard of care in pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I guess we have done this before, but I guess what is different in this situation is that there's a time pressure on it. So that's um, an interesting example with sildenafil where a similar mechanism of action is being adopted in different spheres with the aim of affecting uh, vasculature in different uh, locations of the body. And so is that similar to what we're we're seeing in COVID-19? So I suppose the differences are that the mechanism of actions have to match in some way according to the disease process for them to be paralleled. And I think that we, we are seeing a bit of evidence in, in the immunosuppression realms where we are seeing an immune phenomenon called cytokine release syndrome, which is an interesting phenomenon in the latter part of severe disease, which is associated with much mortality. I guess this gets to the heart of what your article is about, really, this seemingly contradictory um, idea that maybe in order to be able to defeat an infection and all of its uh, consequences, that we might actually need to introduce ways to suppress the immune system and that maybe not all the damage from an infection comes directly from the infection itself. Yeah, it is quite a paradox, isn't it, that... um the use of immunosuppression is is turning off the one system we're relying on to fight a virus. In many ways, COVID-19 is, has two stages. Uh, if we look at it, the initial viral 
phase where the virus replicates and causes damage. And towards the latter stages, the immune response may take over. Now, it's important to understand that in COVID-19, around day 8 to 10, we sometimes see in a subset of patients, um, not all, a a rise in pro-inflammatory molecules such as interleukin-6 and interleukin-1 and uh, TNF-alpha. And with this, there's a large recruitment of immune cells into the lungs. This results in lung damage and edema, some of which causes some long-term fibrosis. And what we would do in this situation is to suppress this immune reaction and prevent that damage. And the reason why this is interesting in some ways, although devastating, is that it is comparable to other cytokine release syndromes we've seen in other clinical entities such as rheumatic or autoimmune diseases as well as malignancies. In adults onset still disease, we have a similar syndrome called macrophage activation syndrome. And in hematology, we see CAR T cell therapy. And in that, we have a cytokine release syndrome in that situation as well. And there are certain parallels we can draw upon. uh, And immunosuppression agents such as tocilizumab, which targets the interleukin-6 receptor, And steroids as well have been used in these situations to try and dampen the immune response uh, in these hyperinflammatory states. So Sam, maybe I can ask, what makes the hyperinflammatory state in COVID-19 any different to the hyperinflammatory state that one might get associated with any other type of infection, bacterial or viral infection? It tends to occur in the later part of disease. It also has seemed to have more lung involvement. And therefore, once the lungs get involved, there's a high propensity for patients to end up requiring increased ventilatory support. I suppose cytokine release syndromes in other entities have a more systemic uh, involvement. But I suppose in COVID-19, there's more lung predominant and therefore uh, can, is associated with a lot a higher mortality. Immunosuppression has been the mainstay of treatment in most of these cytokine release syndromes, and they have been trialing the immunosuppressive agents in COVID-19 scenarios. Tocilizumab has not had any clear large data from randomized control trials, but has had some promising results so far. Recently, the dexamethasone from the recovery trial has had a preprint releasing some of its evidence, and that has been acknowledged by the WHO. And what they've shown is that in the recovery trial, the dexamethasone arm compared to standard of care, where they were giving dexamethasone at 6 milligrams for 10 days, reduced mortality in patients who were requiring oxygen but not being ventilated. And the reduction in mortality was slightly higher in patients who were were ventilated. Now, given this is a preprint and has not been peer reviewed, I, I say it with some caution, but they, it sort of illustrates the point that um, dexamethasone and other immunosuppressives may, be, may have a role. Um, it's interesting that steroids in previous coronavirus outbreaks, such as SARS and MERS, had mixed results. While some said that they reduced in ventilation time, there was also the adverse effects, such as fractures and psychosis, that was noted. And there was also some suggestion that it may delay viral clearance. However, the clinical significance of this was not entirely clear. So I guess our past experience with these immunosuppressive agencies, we need to look at whether they're effective in this current situation, but also the longer term consequences of their use. Mm, So there's some good points here, um, Sen, and I think obviously that dexamethasone space is something um, to watch, and that's something that's that's been emerging in in very recent times. Tell me a little bit more about some of the um, the other immunosuppressive therapies that are targeting specific immune pathways. Well, definitely tocilizumab, I guess, has had had some interest. There's so far, there have been very small um, retrospective studies which have shown some promise in terms of a reduction in time to clinical recovery. Um, but these are all very small and not controlled randomized trials. There are some studies underway and hopefully results will come back to show us whether these are in fact effective in COVID-19. Other treatments that we could consider are medications such as anakindra, which target the interleukin-1 pathway. This has been used in macrophage activation syndrome in adults onset stills disease. 
and this is another therapy that has been extensively researched, but however, results uh, from large randomized control trials are still yet to come. So I guess you're talking about tocilizumab targeting the IL-6 pathway, mm. anakinra targeting the IL-1 pathway, and, and these and IL-6 and IL-1 being part of this um, vicious reinforcing inflammatory cycle, which can potentially do the damage and cause mortality in, in COVID-19. I guess this is a, the space which is of really great interest, interest just because this is where a lot of the death occurs. And this is what we're most scared about in COVID-19. Um, otherwise, well, people who seem to be otherwise getting better, who might even be um, you know, clearing the virus reasonably effectively, um, suddenly succumbing to this aggressive, hyperinflammatory, reinforcing, snowballing type of state. Yeah, certainly. I mean, they they say the mortality rate with uh, associated with the ARDS is close to about thirty percent in some studies, and definitely that um, a lot of the mortality is seen in the latter part of disease and immunosuppression. Uh, this hyperimmune response definitely may be playing a part, um, and therefore, I guess we we need to be we have to have mechanisms to identify this early because um, it is a quite a rapid and dynamic response. Because I guess that raises a, a point really about where this belongs in terms of where in the course of COVID-19 uh, this slots in. Uh, you know, as much as we've talked about trying to dampen the hyperinflammatory state, there's a point um, earlier on where potentially there, there, there's a potential for risk here. So I guess we've gone, you know, in risk in terms of breaking down the, the immune system, which is actually um, fighting off the virus. Definitely immunosuppression needs to be targeted at the right period of time in the disease process. It, this is mainly for patients who start to have hypo, uh, a need for oxygen, requiring them to be hospitalized and require su supplementary oxygen. That is the stage where possibly immunosuppression may prevent them from either going to ICU and requiring more invasive ventilation. And that is just, that is where we need to be targeted. Well, Sen, thank you. That's been great. Thank you so much for joining us to talk a little bit about repurposing immunosuppressive medications um, in COVID-19. It's really a space that we're going to be watching in the future. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. The views of the guests of the hosts on this podcast are their own and may not represent Australian prescriber or NPS Medicine Wise. I'm David Liu. Stay safe. And thanks for joining us once again on the Australian Prescriber Podcast.